Hi, and welcome to Wrong Way. And today... We are going to disassemble this 134 volt monstrosity of a performance wheel, the Bigot Master, and check its quality from the inside. So, let me tell you more about it. Wrong way. Before we get into it though, I wanted to share with you guys a bucket list moment for me. Boy, did that feel good. Anyways, big thanks to my eWheel for providing me this wheel for testing purposes, and big thanks to Surge for helping me out to do this teardown. Those videos require a lot of work and action from me editing, remembering to feature all of the details and test everything, so I'd really appreciate a like and a subscribe on this video, especially because those videos you usually don't get that much traction. So let's get right into it. When you try to put in the new charger by Bigod, there will be no spark, even if the charger is not connected to the wall outlet, which is great. This means that the charger has a anti-spark protection. However, as we check with a voltage meter later, the charge board is still hot. And Bigode is still the only company amongst electric unicycle manufacturers that doesn't have a safe solution for charging. So both if something falls into the charge board or something happens to the cables that run from the charge board to the batteries, then you might have a short circuit. All other electric unicycle manufacturers do have a safer solution for charging. So I wonder, while with all of the R&D that Bigode has, and the simpleness and rather cheapness of implementing such a solution, Bigode still fails to do it. I think they would make a lot of riders happy and create a lot more customers if they would make safer choices for their wheels. However, it's nice to see those bigger GX20-4 ports and they are covered by first a seal and then additionally the trolley handle. So the chance of something getting in there is relatively small when riding. Now I will remove the additional tail grizzler pads, which help me a lot with braking. The stock pad is relatively small there. And remove some additional padding on the top, which serves both to grip the wheel better, but most of all it just covers the wires which go from battery to motherboard there. I'm scared. Truly scared that they don't have any additional protection in that. Additionally, if you squeeze the wheel a lot, I think they might just rub against there. So. Yeah, cable management here, not the best, especially because those wires are just, you know, you have a short there and it's dangerous. Now, if you want to work on your wheel and if you want to change the tire, which we will do now, you have to remove the padding, which is also sort of part of the wheel's enclosure. Now, I'm really a fan of the idea because first you have the layer of rubber, which protects the wheel from like softer falls. And then you have the plastic, which prevents it from harder falls. Look at briefs. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it's empty here and it goes out through here. Listen. I think that's really cool. However, I would like to have some sort of solution where you just don't have to put the double-sided tape out every time you want to work on the wheel or change the tire. Because you will just need to reapply new tape or the old one will not hold anymore. Looks like a used condom. The bottom pads are also harder to access because you need to take off the pedals to get the bottom pads off. Taking off pedals from Bigode wheels is awesome though. I feel like they nail the tolerances, you don't need a hammer even to hammer the metal rod out and they don't tend to bend. There's no spacers anymore in there so that's much more easy. The hex screw on the side of the L hanger decides how much friction you have when you want to lift up or down the pedals. All of those screws are of the same size. Really good execution here Bigode. The pedals themselves are big and spacious, however a bit heavy. I like the patterns, I like the design, and I love those mountain bike studs. They really keep me in place. They are also angle adjustable. You can do that by unscrewing those small Phillips screws on the side. Be careful though, they might break. And then you can screw in hex screws which are underneath my shred light mount here for the SLF axis. 
Really great job on the pedals here, Bigot. That's how it should be, you're leading the industry. Afterwards, we can remove the bottom pads, which reveal more of the nakedness of the Bigot Master. And we can see the pretty sturdy kickstand in the back. However, it's not so sturdy when the wheel is standing on it. I feel it has something to do with the placement of those knobs in the back. The phase wire, which leads to the motor from the motherboard, is also exposed on the side. Again, I would like to see that covered. I wouldn't want anything to happen to this wire ever, because it's freaking dangerous. Now with the pads removed, we can see a massive radiator underneath the motherboard. That's really cool. And there's also a beeper right behind the lights. It is well audible and nicely placed. The back of the lights is also covered with plastic. So yeah, pretty cool job here. To make the disassembly process easier, we will also now remove air from the air shock. And the shock has been performing rather well. It also has rebound adjustment and I didn't feel like it was leaking too much air. When it comes to ride characteristics, well, stay tuned for the final review and check out my ride video of the Bigode Master. The middle part is what is moving here on the Bigode Master when it comes to suspension. And at the end of those sliders, you can see a rubber stopper, which prevents this metal part clonking into the metal part. However, it's still a very strong clonk that I hear every time I bottom it out and every time the suspension fully extends. However, the sliders work really smoothly, especially compared to the S22. Check it out. It's like almost no resistance. That's why the suspension is so like stiff. The, the sliders, they're just like, it just won't work. But this thing, this has some, like, this has some loose parts. I don't know where, but... Everywhere. Okay, I think it's everywhere, you're right. But anyways, this is how it should work. It is not perfect though as after about 800 kilometers of riding there are some tolerances there. They're not terrible though, I'll keep observing them. I think it just happened over 30 kilometers, I didn't feel it initially. Maybe it's just some screw loose there or something? No, like look at here. First of all, moving is those brass part. Yeah. And also not just, uh, okay, just a tool. Yeah, so this is moving in. Because like, this is essentially the part connecting the two halves. Yeah. And here we have the rest of the... The other one. Bit, but I think the left one more. To remove the wheel from the EUC, it's actually quite simple. On one side, all of the screws are exposed and you can just unscrew them. They're also covered with Loctite, which is really great. Remember though that they have also some spacers, which is good, but they might fall out and you then you might search for them for 40 minutes like we did. Oh. No! No! Oh. Uh, maybe let's find it. On the other side, we need to unscrew some screws that are holding the phase wire in place. Then we get access to the three, not four, three screws that hold the motor on this side. Then we need to remove the front right battery pack. By the way, big thanks to Mitch G here from the forum electricunicycle.org, which found this method to be the fastest tire change on the master. With that done, we have access to the phase wire and we can just pull out the motor and change a tire. And I can't stress this enough. I think it's awesome that you can do this here without unplugging those phase wires. Usually it's a pain in the ass to get either to the motherboard or to some compartment. And then you have to disconnect the battery. It's awesome that you can do it here without unplugging the phase wires. The seal for the bearings looks alright. I think there won't be any trouble when this comes to contact with water.
Yeah. So we'll be also changing the tire now and we started this teardown with this tire change because usually it's very difficult to perform a tire change on the UC and uh, we are changing the tire because this TST it's not really good for this sort of wheel you're standing very high up and it just throws into one the other direction it's not responsive I think this UC should cover the um, street tire or at least the tire which is on the extreme Bull Commander HS but we are going to change it for a uh, Michelin City Pro and don't worry in the final review I'll also tell you how it performed on this stock tire. This UC does have a tube tire in fact a motorcycle tube tire and we kept this setup also for the Michelin City Pro. Yeah. So clean! When putting the motor back in, you might have a bit of a hard time placing this spacer, which is in between the motor and those um, slider parts on the side of the wheel. It's best to remove those battery packs to make the alignment of the spacer a bit easier. If Bigode just made the motor mount different for this motor, which is like attached to the motor, well, we wouldn't have this issue, but we don't, because Bigode uses the same motor for all of their performance wheels. With that said, now it's time to dig a bit deeper into the wheel. And to do that, we need to remove the top cover. And first we encounter the trolley handle, which is made out of plastic. So yeah, watch out for, with that because you can just break it. To remove this cover, which is also a seat, we need to get four hex screws out. And fun fact here, the front light is adjustable and that's a great feature. I really like that, but it's connected with the same screws to the light module. so. If you actually pull down the lights, it stretches the top cover a bit and then the, the buttons look a bit off. So yeah, I, I guess it's just big out. But I think it's still a good idea with this rubber cover. It's still very cool to have like an integrated seat and some protection for milder faults. It could extend a tag further over the front or back of the wheel to act as a bumper. Underneath that cover, we have another cover, which is for the motherboard. There's also the GX20-4 charge ports, as well as the wires going into the motherboard compartment. Funny fact here, um, there is a seal around those wires, but there's also gaps inside. So yeah, this seal could be done better, maybe with some silicone. Other than that, there are also some gaps in the plastic and definitely with the amount of mudguards that this wheel has, there will be some water spraying into this general compartment. Remember, this wheel doesn't have any IP rating. I wouldn't ride it in rain before sealing off all of the possible water ingress points. After removing four flathead screws, we can get a glimpse of the motherboard compartment. There isn't any water sealing gasket around it, nor is there any rubber seal. So probably if you want to ride this thing in rain, better to go around the edge of that cover with silicone. On a top board, we can find some foam over it, which easily breaks. I'm not really sure what the purpose of it is. Maybe against water, maybe against something else. Filter, I'm not really sure. And there's also the big display, which is awesome. This display is nicely readable, maybe not in extreme sunlight, but yeah, it's a great feature. Next, we disconnected the main battery connector and turned the wheel on for a second to discharge the capacitors. More on the batteries later. We did that so we can unscrew the singular, yes, one single screw that holds the top motherboard in place and see what's underneath. And underneath there, there is some sort of weird tape underneath the motherboard and the three hefty capacitors. We don't really know their values because they're put in in this way. Um, there's also no silicone between the top motherboard and those capacitors, which is kind of bad. But look at the amount of MOSFETs. This is the first wheel that has 24 MOSFETs and this is why it has such insane power. It's really smooth, but the power output, crazy. But where does the energy come from? Glad you asked. Well, here we have four batteries in series, and that's a very different setup to what we usually see on electric unicycles. And in some ways, the setup is pretty problematic because if one wire fails or some connector fails, then there is no backup. There's no battery pack separation that you can like, come to a stop on just one battery pack. Furthermore, I don't know about the balancing because usually you do the balancing of the battery packs at the end of a charge. 
But here, because those battery packs are in series, I always get different voltages across those different battery packs, which shouldn't be there. Now, for now, the differences aren't that huge, and I don't know what the differences are within one battery pack, but I'm just not sure how reliable this system is. But it also comes with some upsides, which is that the BMS is probably cheaper for the lower voltage battery pack and you also don't have such a high voltage in one single battery pack so it's not as dangerous as having 134 volt setups all across the wheel. I also heard concerns that if a BMS fails then you will automatically have a cutoff and this is actually not the case because what we have here is not really a BMS, it's a passive balancing system. So the battery is always hardwired to the motherboard and to the charge board. So even if the BMS fails, you can still draw electricity from those battery packs. The motherboard only gets electricity from the battery packs, nothing else. There is no communication between the board and the battery packs. So to actually cut off on the wheel, there would have to be a major battery failure like popped cell or broken cell and the short circuit or just a short circuit from water, but not a BMS failure. And it's the same with the veteran Sherman, but in a Sherman, if the motherboard sees that the BMS fails, then it will pop up the BT low issue and bring you to a sp stop and make tilt back. It also has the two battery packs connected in parallel, so if one fails, you can still drive with the other, but at extreme acceleration or extreme speed, it wouldn't be enough to hold you upright. But in most situations, probably it would. This won't happen here. Probably you will just notice that you can't charge the battery to 100%, and that's it. So yes, it's worse than on King Song and Veteran wheels, but a broken BMS doesn't necessarily mean a cutoff. There is also a small daughter board underneath the charge ports and I can see some fuses there too, so that's great. 30 amps each. I don't know what the setup is, I don't know how everything functions, but I think that there is just a tad more security and safety here than on previous gen or not 134 volt wheels by Bigode. All of those single battery wires go to one connector that leads to the motherboard, so if that breaks, well, also faceplant. But there's also a communication wire between those batteries. I'm not sure what it does. Next up we decided to disassemble a battery pack box. <laughs> it was easy. Here we have some foam. Just more foam. So this one has like a hole. I'm definitely happy to see shrimp crab here. It wasn't present on the S22, for example. That's the flimsiest thing I've seen in life. Jesus Christ. That's like Happy Meal quality. That's bad. They should make that more strong. Yeah, it's like... Look, like even the, the foam bends it out because this plastic is so weak. Because probably this was like flush, but now it's like curved. Happy meal quality. So yes, the battery pack boxes or mounts are very flimsy and all of it is just plastic. And the plastic around the screw, which hold the lids in place, also have broken and I didn't even have a hard fall on this wheel. Additionally, there is no seal or no waterproofing measures around the screw holes, so water can get in through those screw holes. That is not acceptable. That's also all plastic. It's not 3D printed, huh? Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> progress. So for the exposed parts of plastic from the outside, from the inside, the mechanical protection isn't that good. And we also decided to put tape all around, or you can also use silicone, to make sure that water wouldn't get in through those screw holes. When it comes to the battery pack itself, I like that the battery pack is just thin and there's no pluses and minuses of cells touching next to each other, which is usually the case with those 900 watt hour packs. And those are Samsung cells, so probably no issues like we had with the LG packs. There is supposedly also a buzzer inside and a temperature meter, so if something goes haywire, maybe the packs will buzz or beep. And this pretty much concludes the teardown of the Bigode Master. 
And in general, guys, I gotta say, I'm stunned. Bigode has several, many, many nice ideas and innovations in this wheel. And I'm really impressed with the solution for suspension design. This is by far more comfortable than the S22. You know, it has its, hic its hiccups, but it will work longer. I, I'm sure it will work longer than the one in the S22. We have the batteries in series, which, you know, we'll find out if it's any good or not. I, I would rather see a, you know, BMS that is a BMS and not just passive cell balancing. So, you know, this the safety isn't yet on the level of, for example, I don't know, Sherman or King Song, although you know what happened with the King Song S22 as well. Uh, but yeah, in general, except for waterproofing and the Happy Meal quality of the battery packs, I gotta say there's a lot of things done right here. And yeah, I guess now time will tell what happens with those wheels if they just don't balance or if something else becomes an issue, the wiring on the side, because Bigode is a Chinese laboratory and we are its hamsters. We are its crazy hamsters that just want to push the envelope of what's possible on those wheels and probably will do so. Uh, so yeah, I guess if you're still here, leave a like on the video, subscribe to see more content like this. I'll see you in the next video. See you soon.